I was a few minutes ago, found out that the uh, coffee maker does work. Um, and so I was able to uh, experiment with it. Please bring in two cups when you um, go in there to get your coffee. Uh, my name is Mike Hayes, and I am with h &R Block. I'm the district marketing coordinator. Uh, we have, uh, I'm on the company side, we have both franchises and companies. Um, I cover the area from uh, Roseville to Elk Grove, Dixon to South Lake Tahoe, and then I also support our Reno locations. And so if you guys are doing deals in uh, the two states, uh, California and Nevada, and you're wanting to connect your buyers with some great people uh, to assist them in this, one of the most important processes uh, of their, of many of their lives, uh, let me know. Um, I'm going to talk to you guys about a couple things, but really, I want to hear from you what questions you guys have. Um, and as we kind of transition this, we've got about you know 45 minutes or so of time. I want to make this as interactive as possible. Uh, you don't need another person just kind of out here lecturing you about changes and. Uh, everybody's confused about, about tax laws, but it's, so I want to make this a great dialogue for us uh, to talk about. Um, I've been with H&R with Block uh, since about 2006. Um, started as a client prior to that, uh, after my CPA um, uh, caused me to get a nice little tax bill. I decided I'd go into H&R Block and see if they could help me. Uh, ended up getting me some money back and I was hooked with them. Um, from that point forward, um, years later, after uh, experiencing, having a great experience with them, I decided I'd come and uh, kind of hang my hat with them. I was uh, have a long history uh, in being in business. I was in the uh, real estate market back in the uh, 80s boom, had a great time in the mortgage industry, and transitioned that knowledge over into taxes and, and really seeing how I can best help individuals uh, take from complex situations, streamline them, make them understandable, and uh, assist them in making some wise uh, decisions. I'm a true believer that you know a more informed consumer makes wiser decisions. Um, and so if we as, as whether realtors or tax professionals or professionals in general can help to educate our clients, then they're walking in that much further ahead, and so they don't get kind of finagled by a lot of paperwork or that type of thing, but we're able to kind of really help educate them uh, to the point where they're, they're better informed and they have a better understanding of the choices that they're making. Make sense? Makes All right, sense. you guys want to get started? Yes. yes. Oh, you have a question already? Right? I do. Excellent. The difference between the correct tax ramifications on a short sale versus a foreclosure. Okay. Excellent. Excellent uh, question that we have. So his question was, the, what are the correct ramifications of a short sale versus a foreclosure? So there may or may not be a difference between the two in that um, it, it starts off with whether or not there is a tax liability for the client. So is it the client's primary residence? That's the first thing that you want to ask. Is it their primary residence or their uh, so it starts there. If it's rental property, there could be significant tax consequences uh, for that particular buyer, whether it's a foreclosure or a short sale. Foreclosure or short sale basically uh, comes down to, if, for those of you that know, foreclosure, uh, a foreclosure is when the bank says or the lender says, you know what, you have, you have defaulted on the loan that we provided to you, uh, we're going to reclaim the property. In some instances, that's the only recourse that the lender has, is they can take the property, they can't go after the, the uh, buyer, uh, you know, for their personal assets. And so that's what's called a non-recourse loan, and you guys are familiar with that. Uh, so they have the property that they can go out, recover that property, resell it. Uh, if they come up short on that property, they can't go back after the client for additional funds for that amount that they're, they, they're shortened on, okay? A recourse loan is, is if they refinance a property and it was, say for example, they were doing consolidation debt or they were doing, um, you know, they could be doing home improvements and that type of stuff, but if it's not to substantially improve the property or acquire property, the property, then there is that nuance for taxes that, that could take place. So if it's a short sell, Person is short sold, basically they're selling the property for less than what is owed on the property to a, a buyer that is approved by both the lender 
and and the and the seller and, uh, and the and the buyers are all in agreement that this is the price we're going to purchase the property for. Now it's up to the lender at that point whether they're going to send that client what's called a, a 1099C or a cancellation of debt. And that's the big question. Will the lender send a cancellation of debt? Sometimes they would send a 1099A, which is an abandonment, uh, uh, notice of abandonment of the property. Uh, but cancellation of debt is the big thing. Will the, and, and as part of that negotiation, uh, for those of you that deal exclusively with short sales, I would make sure that that's part of the deal. Is that if we're going to agree upon the buyer for a short sale, then we want to also agree that the once we we've, we've come to this agreement that there is not going to be a cancellation of debt to that seller or the owner of the property uh, who's involved in that short sale. Yes. So I've done quite a lot of short sales, uh -huh. and I've gotten um, full settlement language, but my clients still get 1099, and the reason being is what I tell my clients is when they receive that 1099, which I just dealt with the two weeks ago because it is tax time and right. they're receiving them, yep. take them right to your tax professional. They'll yep. know what to do. Absolutely. My understanding, and correct me if I'm wrong, is no matter what, the bank is going to send that 1099, and it's up to the tax professionals to work with our clients to um, see what can be done with it during the tax filing. Correct. So it, two things are happening. It's up to the lender to determine whether or not they're going to send it or not. So and they so, may never so, send it. So they may or may not send, the lender may or may not depend on the type of loan. So typically when they will send it to 99, cancellation of debt is if a portion of the loan is not a, is a recourse loan, meaning that it was not, a, so it's not for the purchase or the building of property, or to substantially improve property. So, and so, when as you're negotiating uh, with your lenders, ask them: Is this a recourse loan, or is it a non-recourse loan that we're working with? So, if it's typically what happens is the person goes in, new first uh, deed of trust, uh, they're coming in to purchase the property, five hundred thousand dollars, two hundred thousand, whatever that amount is. They, you know, got good credit, eighty percent loan to value. The lender gives them that 80% on, on the loan. Uh, that particular portion of that loan to purchase that pro property is non-recourse, meaning that they can only go after the, the, the borrower for the amount of, uh, for that property. So they can only take the property back. If they decide to say, you know what, hey, market's good, we've gone up 20% uh, or 80% or, you know, it's great times before 2007, we're going to, you know, we're up 300% on our property, we're going to grab 200 extra thousand dollars out of the property and we're going to Tahiti, Bahamas, take a trip all, around the world. That portion, that $200,000 that they grabbed out and wasn't for, um, for a significant improvement of the property, it could be a for debt consolidation, it could be for a variety of things. That particular portion of the loan, if they did it as a that two hundred thousand dollars additional above whatever their original amount was, the lender could go after them and give them that cancellation of debt on that two hundred thousand dollars. So if it's if the loan is modified, say for example, a client walks in and you know, miraculously they get approved for a modification and it actually goes its full course. Uh, say for example, if it started off as 400000 as your as the loan amount, they say, okay, we understand that you're upside down on it, it's only worth 200000 If it is a non-recourse loan that they're modifying, that 200000 basically is, has no tax consequence because it's a non-recourse loan that they've modified. However, if the property is worth 200000 Markets go great, you got another 200000 on there, that two additional 200000 and they bring it back to the original 200000 then they could have a cancellation of debt on that additional 200000 Does that make sense? Is there a limit to California on this, like four years or something? Um, as far as for them to sit, submit the, the cancellation of debt? Yeah. Yeah, there, there is a limit. I don't have the, the, the exact time frame. But typically, whenever they issue the cancellation of debt, you go back to that particular year. Uh, we can check on insolvency, whether it's a primary residence, and then there's a lot of things that we can do in, in regards to that. And then based on their filing status, it's up to uh, $2 million, I believe, for a married filing joint couple, up to $1 million under, under this. And that's for cancellations of debt from 2007 up until the end of this year. 
So if they're going to get modifications, they're going to do cancellations, and you know, you think you have buyers that are potentially in trouble with their, their mortgages, they have until the end of this year before that debt relief act uh, expires, unless they extend it. This question that I'm going to write here. Yes. My understanding is that if I have a house for three hundred thousand, value goes up to seven and I refi five, put in a pool, whatever I do. Right. But that entire note and deed of trust by the bank, if it's Chase or Wells or whoever, that entire note becomes non-recourse. It the can. entire, you know. Yeah. Because so that's before 58 says that becomes, an, but you're saying from an accounting standpoint, when I file my taxes, mm -hmm. you're going to break that into two pieces? Correct. So how much of it, so we're going to look at what the basis, uh, you know, a, a, a client has in the property. So how much ownership, how much of the pie do they actually own in the property? So if I put in a hundred thousand of my own money, um, and we're looking at that $500,000 as a, so, so we're going to automatically, it's down to $400,000. And then if that original loan for tax purposes was say, you know, another 200,000 or something like that mm -hmm. of a loan, then we're going to take 300,000 off, off of it. So a hundred of my personal, which is the basis, 200,000 of the original loan to purchase the property. And then the other may be subject uh, to to the cancellation of debt, or for tax purposes, of what we're going to that they may um, have as additional income. And so, what we also what, what this all uh, kind of equates out to is that if a person, the 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 long and short of it is that a person who has a cancellation of debt could be subject to having uh, having to be taxed on additional income. So, in essence, if I come in and I say. Um, you know, I'm going to give you, what's your name? Trish. Trish. Trish, you know, I'm feeling really generous. Um, I'm going to give you $1,000. In the eyes of the IRS and in the state, uh, IRS is looking for all worldwide income. doesn't matter where you get it from, how it was derived. If I say I'm going to give you $1,000 for all intents and purposes, uh, I'm gonna, I want you to pay it back to me $100 a month until it's paid back, plus a little bit of interest because I just don't give away free money. That's just me. Uh, and, um, and then I say, you know what, uh, two months down the road, you know, I haven't received the payment. Three months down the road, I says, okay, you know what, I'm going to forgive your debt. At the time that the loan was, was issued, uh, it, there was a taxable consequence. There was money that was handed to, to Trish um, that the IRS says, you know what, hey, you received money. I want a piece of it, right? Uh, it should have been taxable at that point or for that tax year. At the point that I, I say, you know what, your debt is forgiven, it becomes income, whether she used it for a house, whether she used it for a car, whether she used it to pay, you know, to give to, to children. I would never give them to children, just me. But uh, it, it's, you know, whatever she used it for, from an IRS standpoint, it should have been taxable, uh, and it's, it, it remains untaxable as income up until the point where it becomes canceled and it says, okay, now this is, this is a gain that you receive, even though you may not have the house anymore, you may not have the, the purchases anymore, it's still something that should be taxed. And so, but based on the type of loan that it was and the type of property that was secured by it may, may uh, cancel out a, a, the, it being added as additional income. Now, Trish, I'm going to answer your question and then... Well, it's kind of, it's sort of kind of answered. I just got a loan mod uh -huh. that became effective January. Okay. And they did do a um, huge principal reduction with the forgiveness mm -hmm. and in the contract. They right. stated that. So, since this is 2013, so am I going to have to pay taxes on that principal reduction? <laughs> is, qu first question is, yeah, first question is, is this your primary residence? Yes. This is a primary residence. So, there, there are some set sites and it continues to be your primary residence at today. So, they're uh, getting with your tax professional. We would take a look at a couple of things. A, whether you fall under the provisions of the Tax Relief Act. Uh, if you fall under that, then there's up to $2 million merit filing jointly that we, we may be able to set aside for you for tax purposes. Um, if, if, you, if it were a rental property, then we would look at basic on your solvency, whether, you're, whether you're, the fair market value of your property and all of your assets are, um, if they are greater than, than your outstanding debt plus the forgiveness, then you're considered solvent, meaning that you have more money, more assets than you have debt. But if the, 
the reverse was true, meaning that your, your total market value of your property assets and that type of thing was less than the debt that you had, then you would be considered insolvent, and then you have the choice of you know, bankruptcy um, to also help mitigate, or um, for tax purposes, we may be able to, there's a form that we use to kind of determine how much of that canceled debt uh, is a taxable consequence to you. So we can definitely take a look, but everyone's situation can be different. So that's, yes, not, sir. that's not considered a gift, that's just a loan, correct? It's not a gift like for your parents giving money or something? Correct, like correct. So any parent person, parents can give money all the day, not me as a parent, I wouldn't do it. But if you felt so inclined <laughs> to do it, <laughs> go ahead, yes. So you're saying that the Debt Forgiveness Act applies to the differentiation upon money's owed and lost income from the bank on the shortfall under the debt, debt Forgiveness Act? Yeah, so it's so it's, it starts off with the primary primary yeah, residence. Yeah, I understand all yeah. that. I, I just I was unaware that if I owe four hundred and fifty thousand and they did a loan mod and the current market values call it three hundred uh -huh. and they take my my principal down to three hundred or three fifty, whatever we agreed to. Make it three fifty, it's easy. Yeah. So there's a hundred thousand dollar shortfall. Uh -huh. My impression always was on that loan mod that becomes a taxable event. But you're saying that that modification in the loan mod falls under the Tax Debt Forgiveness Act? It can based on, on whether or not, so the lender will determine whether or not, or they will send a cancellation of debt. Um, and so they, both answers could be correct, meaning that if they opt to, uh, not to send you a cancellation of debt on that additional 100000 then there's not a tax consequence for okay. you. If they do opt to send it, uh, then we would, basically do a, a spreadsheet to determine whether or not any, if any of that uh, money is um, a taxable event for the client, determine whether that, so whether it's insolvency or under the Debt Forgiveness Act, we'll try both of those to determine and, and then, or if they have bankruptcy, so those are the three. So what you're really things. saying is on the loan mod, people need to make sure they get a cancellation of a principal reduction as, Cor forgive, as a forgiveness of debt. Or have that waived. So it's up to the lender to have it, if they want to have that waive, so meaning that they're not going to send a cancellation of debt. Um, that's the, the most ideal. If they're unable to, if they have to send the cancellation of debt, then we'll make sure that they stay at the, uh, in that property as their primary residence through the time that they get that cancellation of debt. I think what Jerry was asking about is, no, if I may, our, our understanding is, if I have a house mm -hmm. and I owe, I owe five, and it sells for three. Mm -hmm. So as a basis, if that goes to foreclosure, the Debt Relief Act does not apply, and I now have a two hundred thousand dollar tax consequence. Depend. It really depends on if that was if you were insolvent. If that's my primary time. resident, right? And and let's for just forget insolvency. I'm right. not going to file a bankruptcy. Right. I'm not going to do any of that. Mm -hmm. I'm just walking from my house. Right. And it was my. And it was my purchase money, mm -hmm. so it's a non-recourse loan. Right. So my understanding is that two hundred thousand dollars in a foreclosure, I'm gonna have a tax consequence. Not necessarily. So if it's a non-recourse loan, they can only go after the property, not you personally. Yeah, but I still owe. I st still owe the government the difference between five hundred and three hundred in a foreclosure. The Debt Relief Act does not apply to a foreclosure. Correct. Correct. So if what we would be able to do is then, as part of the Form Nine Forty Two. Uh, be able to take a look at where where they they are as part of their primary residence. So if they no longer are in the residence at the time that of the cancellation, so say for example, they came put the the notice on the door, um, and and said you know we are we're selling your your house at auction, you may still have have an opportunity to save uh, that from being an action that two, save that two hundred thousand. So there's still opportunity there. So it's not it's not an automatic. You owe two hundred thousand of additional income because it was foreclosed upon. Yes. Back to short sales again. Uh -huh. There's different types of short sales. Correct. There's chaffers and there's regulars and there's all different kinds. Of, banks got all kinds of names for this stuff. Does that matter tax wise? It doesn't. It's just what it's whether or not there is a cancellation of debt issue, uh, and that's what determines your tax consequence. Is that the lender says, hey, here is a here is monies that. We were unable to recover from from the the borrower, um, and so it's forgiven debt. Here you deal with it from from an income standpoint. I'm going to get her, and then I'll get to you. Question. I had a question. So I was 
So that 200,000, if you get a loan mod, mm -hmm. and you say that that needs to be taxed, it, it might need to be taxed, wouldn't that be spread out the rest of your loan? Because you have the rest of the loan to pay it off. So couldn't you break up that debt for over the next 20 years or whatever? You, the rest you, of your loan you, typically, typically what the lenders will do is at the point that they forgive the loan, it's a tax consequence at that point because it's no longer a loan. It's no longer an advertised or it's no longer a loan that's. Uh, it's not something that's tied in with the loan. It is a taxable consequence as, as if the loan. Uh, the lender came in and says, "Okay, we modified your loan. Here's two hundred thousand dollars in cash." From an IRS state standpoint, that's earned in, or it's it's passive income uh, that you receive and that you're going to have a tax consequence on. Yeah, okay. yeah it's not a way of of. of so if you get a uh, interest reduction, mm -hmm. you go from six and a half to three and a half. Mm -hmm. Is there any consequence for that? There, not necessarily, because what that says is, if I decide, you know, I you, I was earning ten percent on my investment in you, you know, I and I decide I'm going to reduce my earnings by 5%, so taking it from 10% to 5%, that has no consequence on you. It's a benefit for you, however, it's how much I'm earning off of the money that I've already given to you. It's primarily what is that principal amount that I gave, that 200000 that I gave you, how much do I want to make on it? I can determine how much I want to earn. So that's a better way to do it then. It, correct. Because over the long run, if every one of us that goes in assigning, mm -hmm. we see every day the house sold for 200 mm -hmm. but over the 30 years that they paid it off, they're going to spend 10, 100000 right. or, you know, right. just mm -hmm. a lot more because yep. they financed it. Right, right. So. Best to buy it in cash, but if you don't have it in cash, there's, mm -hmm. there's other options. Yes, quick questions. <laughs> so under the debt forgiveness or not, is the bank's decision sometimes on that, depending mm -hmm. on the property? It, so the debt forgiveness is based on, in part, for the lender. So whether or not they issue you, based on their, their criteria, a cancellation of debt, which is a 1099C uh, cancellation. Right, so there's the A, B, and C 1099? Cor so correct. It's their choice of which one they're going to send you? Well, it's based on their guidelines and the type of loan that it is. And so typically... Non-recourse, yeah. money deal. First right, quality. so if it's a non-recourse loan, then they should not be sending you out... Uh, the cancellation of debt because they can only go and attach the property for a non-recourse loan. Basically, it, it, it stops with the property. If there is, if it's right, so they can't go after you for the money, but they'll still report that as a loss. To correct. The They're going to still report that as a loss. And then you have to pay the tax on it. Not mm -hmm. not for the non-recourse. That's where we're back to. Yeah. The, yeah. The non-recourse. The bank can do what. Correct. Correct. So does someone really negotiate that point pretty strong with their um, the bonds? They can. So when, I, when I'm looking, when I talk with people, uh, clients about loan modifications or if I'm talking with realtors, it's, it's, you know, with any loan, with any product, it's all about the negotiations. Your lender is going to say, here are the frameworks, here's, here's our underwriting criteria, here's what, what, you know, our legal guys have said. Um, if they're wanting to make something happen, you know, so from a bank standpoint, they're not in, well, in years past, they're, they're not in the, the rental game or the holding of property game. They're in the, the security of saying, you know what, let's get this property, uh, put a loan on it, sell it on the secondary market, and let's make some additional money uh, and put some more money in, into motion. So if, if they're not wanting to re uh, take that property back, uh, the right person is going to negotiate appropriately to try to make sure that it's a win-win all the time. So yeah, it's, 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 it's a game, yes. The second. Yes. Uh, <laughs> the first is done. Uh -huh. they're, they're, you know, they, they got the, the tax relief, the relief and all that from California for the first of this year. Yep. The second. Uh -huh. Now, once they decide to say, okay, we're going to accept X number of dollars at close of escrow and, and, re and get rid of it for you. Yep. They can still come back after them, can they not? Yeah. Typically, the seconds are going to be non-recourse. I mean, they're going to be recourse Recourse. loans. And so, yeah, they can go after the, the lenders, uh, or they can go after the borrowers individually. Does it matter when a, when a person files bankruptcy on all this? Um, from a tax point of view, so it, it is, um, so there are bank, uh, bankruptcy laws that supersede everything. Once they go into bankruptcy, then no one, you know, they have that 
that protection uh, from from their property. And so it's really from an IRS standpoint, it's once they've gotten out of it the uh, bankruptcy court, then what's left over, what was decided, and then, then there may be tax consequences as a result of that after bankruptcy, but bankruptcy kind of takes the primary seat. Is there a limit on the bankruptcy? If, if you know, you close and uh, well, 213 now, so say 11, you have to file bankruptcy and close it, finish it. You close, you finally get your short sale 113, does that matter? Uh, if it was not included as it part of the bank, if, included, yeah, if it was included in the bankruptcy, bankruptcy still has, so I'm not an attorney, so, uh, but you know, as I understand it, is is everything stops until bankruptcy is taken care of, and with the modification, will kind of kind of go back into the bankruptcy what that that uh, ruling was. So to amplify what you're saying, if you file a bankruptcy like a Chapter Seven, uh -huh. and you, you get a discharge of debt, which most attorneys do in a BK, right, on the first and the second, uh -huh. uh, unless you go back in and reaffirm, which right. most people do not, right, okay. Um, once they file that bankruptcy, four years later they do a a, a short sale. Mm -hmm. That has already the remaining balances have already been discharged by the BK. Correct. Because sometimes a short sale lender will come back and say, "I want money." It's like, "Hello, right. here's my bankruptcy order." Exactly. <laughs> you you can't stop this. Right. Right. So yeah, definitely. But on a regular following up, what Jerry said on a regular on a regular short sale though, if I take owner occupied. Mm -hmm. So the second comes back and they're owed a hundred thousand, and we give them three thousand in escrow. Mm -hmm. Or my understanding is, if we give them nothing, but they sign off and allow the deed to be transferred mm -hmm. under SB four fifty eight mm -hmm. for as long as that lasts, they have no, they can't come after me at all. Correct, as I understand correct? it. Correct. And now, yep. and my understanding also is on investment properties, even though it hasn't been tried yet, right. that they're using the same law on investment properties. And the attorneys I talked to were saying, you know, it's, someone's going to test it in court, but so far they've been going through. Yeah, is, so, is that correct? Yeah, I, it, and, and it's, it's more difficult with the investment properties, but I have seen. So I've seen clients who are, are systematically going, doing two things. One is they're just saying, you know what, I don't have the money, um, you know, they're going to close out. And so they, they are systematically going through their property, their, their bank of properties. So if they have 10 properties or five properties, they are, you know, okay, this was in trouble. This is going to be my primary residence, um, you know, and then until the bank takes it back or the lender takes it back, they move to the next one that's in trouble, and this is my primary, you know, so because they've got to wait, you know, um, 12 months between the times that they're able to, to do uh, get that the, the debt forgiveness, and so there are a lot of things that are going on. Uh, yeah, someone's going to test it in court, and you know, and may may come back on on all investors. But yeah, there's a lot of things that are out there that's still kind of that gray area. Hmm. You yeah. said that once it was released, they can't do anything to you, but they can say we're not going to release us from the property on the second. On once the, the one, once the bankruptcy writes out the first, wipes out the second. Uh -huh. At close of escrow, the second say, "You give me so much money, or I'm not going to release." The I'm not going to release with the, I can hold on to this property. I do not have to get on. Right. It, 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 that's a legal piece there from, yeah. Yeah, that's a, that's a definitely an attorney so question. So you have some power here. Some yeah, they, they, yes. I have a, more of a specific question. Uh -huh. um, I am currently dealing with a non-owner occupied purchase money short sale. Will they be able to uh, take capital loss to help offset the um, the liquidity or the the 1099. So, um, I mean, it's $100,000 underwater, but I mean, literally, they bought top of the market, put their own money into the rehab, and they're going to lose $100,000. Right. So, no refis, no nothing. It's just been it's all, it's all it's, And it's all their money. So, they'll first be able to get their basis back out of the property, so it's going to reduce it for capital gains purposes by their 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 ownership interest in the property. Um, there could be some things that they could do, um, and, and I'd have to look at kind of what their paperwork looks like as far as what improvements they've made to the property, so to see if we can increase their basis in the property. So if they remodel, if they, you know, $30,000 Thirty thousand. Yeah, so that type of stuff, uh, if they haven't already previously wrote, uh, wrote that information off or depreciated it if that, that was necessary, yeah, we can definitely take a look at that and see if there, there is some additional room for them or opportunity for them to reduce their tax liability. Yeah, we're 
We're just still going to offset the tax liability, that's all. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Interesting. A lot of good stuff. <laughs> what else is there? Um, any other client, client question, client issues? What are you guys finding as as possibly your biggest hurdle right now. So are you guys primarily into uh, doing refinances or doing new purchases? What's kind of the senses of the room? Of, um, what type of work are you doing or is whatever comes across my desk? Short sales. Short, Short sales? sales? Yeah. Short sales, okay. And then what have been some of the, the questions that you've had for your, or the clients have had for you um, as you're having those conversations besides some of the ones that we've talked about? Why is the bank doing it? Right. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> doesn't make any sense. Right, right. Well, you one know. of the biggest things I'd say from my perspective, and I've probably done 70 short sales over the last five years, mm -hmm. is the difference between the delinquency and the debt forgiveness. Yes. Mm -hmm. like, why is there two? Like, how is that possible? So, deficiency? Okay. So, the deficiency and, and the debt forgiveness. Uh, and are you talking about from time frame or there's difference in amounts? Just the fact that, like, it seems like it's a double taxation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a, like a double edged sword. It's like, I'm going to get hit this way or this way. Why is it, you know, there's supposed to be these things to help us right. as homeowners, of course. Mm -hmm. You know, it's always poor me, poor me. Right. Hey, you took out three hundred thousand dollars and bought cars and mm -hmm. boats and trips and whatever else you did. Right. But now it's poor you, poor you. Right. Mm -hmm. And you know, for the most part, I consider myself pretty intelligent, and mm -hmm. well read on this stuff. But that's always a question. It's always like, how come I'm going to get a ten ninety nine plus they could possibly come after me further? Mm -hmm. Now most of the letters say we won't come after you any further. It's not a big deal. Right. But there's still the why do they get to do that? So so it, it's it's it is. Part of it is regulation, uh, a portion of it, you know, and then part of it is, is taxation. And so, from a business standpoint, it's you know we started off with the, the initial thing of, of give a thousand dollars. If I invest a thousand dollars or a hundred thousand or a million dollars into an individual or or secured by a piece of property, then from a tax point of view, I've got some write-offs as a business, as an individual business, to be able to say, you know what. I lost money in this particular deal, so I'm going to reduce my tax liability. So I may have, you know, lent to everybody in the room. I've got one person that, and I'm not picking on you, really. You know, <laughs> you seem like a very nice lady. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> negotiation, negotiation. But, but, I, but I, my whole thing is, I, my, my plan is to make money. But I know the more money that I make off of all the loans that I have in the room, uh, the IRS and the state are going to want a portion of my net earnings from it. And so after I, I paid my staff, after I paid, you know, you know, to you know, all my expenses, the IRS is saying, okay, what, whatever you have left over after all of your expenses, we want a piece of that that pie. Um, if I have a situation where I have one that defaults on, I what I'm looking as a business or as a bank is to say, you know what, I've got, a, I've got this tax debt that's coming over here, but one of the recourses that I have is that this becomes no longer an income producing or an asset for me, but it becomes an expense. And so I'm gonna, instead of me making uh, a million uh, dollars, I'm going to reduce it by that, you know, by that thousand dollars. And so now I'm at $999,999. And so, but from a taxing point of view, that reduces my tax liability. So that's the first thing. The second thing is from the, the from her standpoint or from the borrower's standpoint is that there are some regulatory things that I wrote in the contract that says that if if you default on this, I, I need to be able to be made whole from the loan that I have. So there's a portion of that, and that's part of that whole deficiency. And then from an IRS standpoint, the IRS says, you know what, I want worldwide income. So whether you you found twenty dollars on the ground. If you had a yard sale in your house, if you had you know bought and sold your your grandmother's car, whatever. If you've got a gain on that, if you made a profit from that. So you know, say for example, you know, it, yard sales are big big ones, but I, I want to just kind of make it more micro. Yard sales are great. I bought this you know coffee maker in there. Love the coffee maker. Bought it for a thousand dollars, right? Um, it's now three, four years later. Uh, I'm going to remodel my kitchen, and I'm gonna, I 
got, got out the coffee maker, instead of me buying it or uh, selling it for a thousand dollars, I can only get five hundred dollars for that. So from a tax point of view, there's no tax consequences because my basis or my ownership in there is, although I made money this particular year, I had more invested in that than I sold it for. However, this is the same one that, you know, uh, you know, the Rolling Stones came in for, at, you know, your last meeting, and they decided they loved it, and they, they poured their own coffee. Now, I, that $1,000 is now worth $1,300 when I sell it because, you know, all the members of the band, you know, signed that, that coffee maker. Now, I've got a tax consequence because it's now... $1,300, so that $300 of, you know, $1,000 is my basis or what I owe only in the property. $300 is my gain uh, from, from the sale of that item. And so the IRS says, you know what, based on all this greatness and you having the Rolling Stones in here to sign off on your coffee maker, um, we want a portion of, of that money. And so th those are the differences in there. One is from the regulatory side of I need to be made whole, and then from a personal side, the IRS is wanting any gains. And so if, for example, I loaned, did a loan on that particular coffee maker, and I didn't get the full value from that, uh, and I said, you know, I'm going to forgive you for that $1,300 that you should have paid me, now the IRS is saying, you know what, um, you've got the coffee maker, so you've got the possession of the property, um, and now it's as if I gave you $1,300. Does that make sense? So, it's a, it's, so IRS is always going to look for an opportunity to share in the benefits that you have. Aren't you glad about that? Yeah. What a country, right? Uh, and then the state, the state is not that far behind. Uh, and so, but really, it's all about how do we educate our clients? How do we connect with our clients? Because we've got clients who come from a variety of different backgrounds. So they've got socioeconomic backgrounds. They've got, they get into trouble for a variety of different reasons. So, you know, they, they did a re, uh, refinance on their property. Just checking on time. Um, they did a refinance on their property. They had to, you know, a person got ill in their house. Um, you know, children went off to college and had to pay for it. Uh, you know, so there's a variety of reasons why a person you may, may be at your desk and saying, you know what, it's time for me to either do a short sale or a modification. What are my options? I have clients that come to me annually. Um, you know, it could be a divorce, it could be you know, a spouse dying, a variety of things. And then, how do we help to educate them on here are the options that you have? If you do A, then B happens. If you do C, then D happens. And being able to just kind of give them options because if you've got options as a buyer, if you're informed as a buyer, um, you you can say, you know what, this is this is the worst of the you know better of, of two evils. Or let me try this because this may work, and if this if this doesn't, and what we do at H and R Block is we kind of come alongside you and help to support you. In this. And if, if many of you guys may have like workshops or you guys have trainings or you guys may take over a restaurant and say, hey, if you're interested in coming in and learning about short sales or foreclosures or how to avoid a foreclosure or how to negotiate with your bank, what we're able to do at no cost to you uh, is actually come in and let you know about the tax ramifications of the decision that clients make. That way it's not just the realtor saying, you know what, um, check with your tax professional, and that's what we want you to say, check with your tax professional. Um, but you have an independent person in there to help you explain some of those ramifications and answer some of those questions from a, from a tax side versus from, from just a real estate side. And, and that's what we're here, here to assist and help you with. Um, and so those are some of the things that are important to you. The other thing is that we also want to make sure that, that you as individuals, as individual business owners, so many of you guys are either 1099, some of you may have W-2s and that type, that you're maximizing as a business your, uh, your tax, tax, reducing your tax liability. And so you're taking the proper write-offs, that you're keeping your mileage uh, if, you're, if you're going to do standard mileage uh, or if you've you know, done some major repairs and it's time to do actual mileage, making sure that you're keeping your receipts and you've got a log. Here's my biggest thing that I like to share with independent business owners is that your documentation is your key. So whether you use a calendar, whether you use a smartphone, iPad, tablet, or, or, or computer system, keep records, keep consistent records throughout all 12 months of the year. 
if the IRS or the state question anything, uh, whether, whether it comes down to your deductions or what you claim uh, as income and that type of thing, um, your records are the key. They can only go through your records to determine, um, you know, what what is accurate. And the, and let me tell you, far enough, every single year, tax laws change. Absolutely, positively, every year. What was what was good last year doesn't necessarily make it good this year. And making sure that you've got people that that constantly look and review the tax code. Um, constantly throughout the course of the year as changes happen and can interpret those, uh, HR Block does that. And we look for opportunities to kind of share and educate and make sure that you have everything that you need to be successful. So if you've got rental properties, making sure that, you know, that as you're going to visit those rental properties that you're keeping track of your mileage uh, because that becomes a write-off for you. As you're doing uh, repairs to those properties that you're keeping track of them. And so if God forbid if there's a, a fire in that property or in your primary residence and you lose all your receipts. Have a, 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 an external source, it could be a DVD, it could be a thumb drive, something that you put into a, to a safety deposit box so that if, if you, uh, and, and again, you've got cloud systems, you know, iCloud, you've got uh, a, a ton of different places where you can save your documents to an external place so that if ever there, you know, we hope that there, you, you don't get audited, but chances are in your lifetime you're going to be audited. And guess what? If you've been audited once, guess what? The chances of you getting audited twice are eh, just a little bit better. Yes. I have to share a story that happened to my sister and her husband who had a rental property in San Ramon. Uh -huh. And they were renting another property, and they had their, um, used to be their primary residence. They were renting. They went to their tax professional, it was an H&R Block. Mm -hmm. And they wrote off all the expenses as far as with uh, the time they did for rental, any expense they could find. They got audited because they weren't a licensed realtor. Because yes. they collected all their rental income mm -hmm. and their, uh, their tax uh, advisor did not tell them this. And they got audited the first year and then they got audited every year that they rented and it was a huge tax bill where they started levying their account, leaning, putting liens on their accounts and everything. I never knew that. That's why I wanted to share with y'all because, you know, sometimes um, our relatives see us as realtors having these rental properties and managing them ourselves. And we go and re write off all these expenses and such and they think they can do the same thing, but they can't because they're not licensed realtors. And one of the questions that is asked is, are you a licensed professional real estate? Uh, or be licensed, and and while a person, you know, and that could be some of the education that you provide to your clients is that if they're interested in getting in, so there there we have a lot of people who are you know licensed contractors have, can't drive a nail uh, in, in through paper, um, but they they're but they're licensed contractors. Right? Um, <laughs> There, there, are, there, are, there, are, and, and for some people, it's a great opportunity for them to take, you know, go to a city college or, or get, get their license, you know, a real estate license, so they're able to, to run their business like a business, um, you know, and so they're able to take those, and so they don't run into trouble like that. And so it's based on the amount of property that they have and what they're looking at doing, and if they can see, see the big picture. It doesn't mean that they're going to be competition for you. But it means that, the, again, you come alongside them and say, hey, let me help to educate you so that you're able to handle your property. You, so if, if you come to us as a, um, as, as a client, we're going we're gonna to walk you through your tax situation, let you know why you have a balance due or why you've got a refund. What, what causes that? We're going to go through your, your Schedule C, if you qualify for a Schedule C, and say, hey, here's some things. Here's what you're doing in advertising. Here's what you're doing with your mileage. Here's what you're doing with, with the perks that you're giving to clients. Here's what you're doing with meals. And being able to under, help you understand, here's how you can greater maximize what you're doing and, and minimize your tax liability within the, the confines of the law. We're going to, we have a maximum refund guarantee, which means that no one's going to be able to give you a, a greater refund 
or minimize your tax liability legally than what we were able to do. We stand by the work that we do. Um, and then, then you know, we also have what's called peace of mind, which is that if the IRS or the state, because they change laws all the time, ever disagree with our findings on a return, for thirty-five dollars, we'll we'll not only pay the penalties and interest as part of our standard guarantee, but we'll pay up to $5,500 of, of actual money that you receive or underpayment of penalty if the IRS or the state disagrees with us. And so there's nobody out there that, can, that stands by the product, uh, by their product, by their service, the nation or block. And so the other thing that, and a little piece of, uh, do I have something there? Uh, we have a variety of different things that we do. One of them is that uh, if you, you know, I'm not looking to take you away from your CPA or Aunt Susie who does your taxes all the time, but what I would like to do is I'd like to give you an invitation to come see me or one of my tax professionals uh, to do what we call as a second look. It's like going to a doctor and getting a second opinion. We'll review at no cost to you your tax return, your business returns, if you have, yeah, we do everything from, you know, 1040 EZ, student dependent returns, to Fortune 500 companies and, and everything in between. So we do LLCs, corporations, S Corp, C Corps, uh, limited liability partnerships, et cetera, trust. If you've got whatever your tax situation, we can handle it. And we'll review your taxes, um, cost you nothing, uh, and, and often we find a lot of money that has been left on the table. If nothing else, we've found better ways to educate you on what you're doing. So if you've got a good system in plan, you've got, I'm looking, I love, you know, when I see uh, a tax attorney, CPA, or a tax preparer who I, I review the, your return and it's absolutely done. It means that my, my industry uh, is winning. We're doing what we need to do for you as a client. But when I see that there's opportunities for improvement, it helps me to better educate you so that when you go back to that CPA, that tax attorney, that tax preparer, Aunt Sue, you know, over, over Thanksgiving holiday, that you can ask uh, her those, those detailed questions that I provide to you to make sure that you get, you're maximizing what you're able to do. And then, then we do quarterly times where you can come in, again, at no cost, Say here's where I am. Here's where I am with my quarterly payments. What else can I do? You know, I'm I'm, I'm looking at closing a big deal here. I know I'm going to have a big tax tax consequence. How do how does that quarterly payments work? And make sure that I don't get taxed or penalized for for making too much in one quarter over another quarter. Definitely a great opportunity for you to give us a call. We're open year round. Many of our offices uh, in this area, uh, probably closest to you, would be our Folsom location. Uh, which is at 711 East Bidwell in the uh, Commonwealth Shopping Center. Uh, we have also Down Sunrise at Greenback and back of the Beach Hut Deli. I know you guys know where the Beach Hut Deli is. Uh, on, on Fair Oaks and, and uh, or uh, Greenback, Fair Oaks uh, by Sunrise. Uh, we have a premium office there. We've got Roseville offices. We have Elk Grove offices uh, in Midtown. And so love the opportunity. You know, uh, two things. One is to, to serve you better serve you for your clients. So being able to have that independent third person that can come in and help you to, to educate your clients. Secondly, we want to help your clients as well. And so as they're, they're looking at saying, you know what, do we need to start over? Or am I ready to buy again? That type of stuff. From a taxing point of view, we'll make sure, you know, uh, that, their, that their tax situation is together. Even if they're ready to file bankruptcy, one of the things to know is that uh, in order for you to get approved for bankruptcy, your taxes have got to be filed and completed uh, prior to to uh, to the bankruptcy. And so we help the clients, you know, kind of get up, you know, hey, I haven't filed in nine years, but we'll, we can take care of you. Okay? Any further questions? Well, I thank you guys so much for your time, so, so attentiveness and great questions. And uh, I've got business cards up here. I've got candy, you know, I brought you with candy. Um, and then we also do drop-off envelopes. And so if, you, if you're too busy, you know, real estate market's got you, you can drop off information at our office. We keep it very secure. Uh, take care of it, review it for you, give you a call, let you know that it's done. You can start a return online finish it in the office, start in the office, finish it online, or you can Skype your tax professionals. Uh, and so however you want to be served, we're here to serve you. I'm Mike Hayes and with HR Block, and you've got people. Thank you.